Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. One of my favorite people in the world, Wheels, what's going on? <laughs> hey, Steve, how are you? It's great to talk to you again. Great to talk with you again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll text back and forth and whatever, oh, yeah. but you'll, you'll get his... He'll get his backside up here at some point, or I'll get my backside down there at some point, whatever, and then we'll get together. We'll work it out. Yeah, oh. we'll figure it out. Renee and I were talking about coming to a game again, you know, the other day, and, and then yeah. we're a little uh, we're a little spoiled now that the inn's closed, and that the Lion Inn is closed. We got a little spoiled with that over the years. So yeah. you know, we're still talk we're still talking about it. So maybe we'll figure something out this year. I'd love, obviously, I'd love to get up there and see a game this year and see you and you know other friends in that area and uh, around the team and all that. So we'll 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 uh, we'll just have to see what happens as, as time goes on. But I, I miss coming up there all the time. I really do. Oh, believe me, you're missed. Uh, so, so here we are. The Phillies got hot toward the end of the the first half, and you know, obviously, a lot of it coincided with Robbie Thompson taking over. You've been around it a lot. Um, sometimes a guy doesn't do anything differently than the other guy, but things fall into place. Which you, you know, what do you think about all that when they change up one guy and all of a sudden things get? quote, instantly better. Yeah. Well, in, in the Phillies case, it didn't help. It didn't hurt that the schedule got a lot easier, too. Uh, that was one of those things that happened right about that time. They weren't playing the Mets a lot the way they had been and getting smoked by the Mets. But not being close to it, it's kind of uh, harder for me to, to talk about it, you know, than other times when we've had this situation, you and I could discuss it. But my gut feeling is it was just an atmosphere change. You know, Joe Girardi is a, a great baseball man. I had a few uh, um, instances to be around him down in Florida in the last few years, and he was always terrific to talk to, and he was very gracious and all that. But he's very t- uh, high-strung. Um, Rob Thompson's just the opposite. Got to know him a little bit over the years, too. He's a, he's kind of quiet uh, in a way. Sometimes when you have – look, with today's players especially – and even the veterans, some of them, you really have to be careful trying to be the tough guy because that stuff doesn't work anymore for being the disciplinarian. And I know fans want it to work, but it doesn't. So you might as well forget about it. And sometimes if a guy can just provide the proper atmosphere, and the best example I can give is Charlie Manuel. He did that for the Phillies after Larry Boa. It was a totally different personality change. So I have to think that had something to do with it. Uh, fact that he also was more willing to play some of the younger guys and try some of that even though some of that didn't work some of it did Uh, I think they're a combination of things but for me it's always a matter of the manager setting the attitude in the clubhouse that they feel comfortable to play and if the players feel uncomfortable it's never going to work out and it's so true you cannot be the hard line guy Uh, (laughs) It's just not the way it works with today's players on any level. Uh, it it just it doesn't it doesn't go with this group. Yeah, and the best example that I can give, other than that, the other way is when Dallas took over. Dallas Green took over when Danny Ozark was fired in '79, and Dallas was the toughest guy you ever want to be around. Uh, and they hated him. Uh, they admit it. Uh, they just absolutely hated him being there. But they also knew him from the minor leagues when he ran the minor leagues, and he knew that he had Ruley Carpenter's. Uh, uh, Ruley Carpenter had his back, so he was there to stay. And they were either going to get it done the way he wanted to do it, or they were going to move on and lose that window that they had at that time to be a world champion, which of course they became. Uh, but boy, they did not like Dallas and. And then in the uh, in the years, you know, it's kind of like the the same stories you hear about Joe. Uh, boy, yeah. I didn't like him when I was there, but when I was out yeah. later on, I really appreciated what he did for me. Well, they were all big Dallas Green fans, but uh, there was there was a point, Steve, where it was very tense between Dallas and those players. But he said, "Go ahead, let them fight me. I don't care. Just go out there and play and win." And they did. And that was the opposite example of what we're talking about. It that I've right. been around in my career. 
Yeah, exactly. What do you think of the state of the game itself right now? You know, you look at you've got a lot of haves, have nots, DH. How do you look at it now? Well, it's not the game that I grew up with or that you grew up with. Uh, you know, I've always tried not to be a dinosaur and say, well, you know, it was so much better when I was around. You know, <laughs> it, some, you, know you know exactly what I mean. And some of it is. So they, there are some changes in the way they play the game right now that are not the way that I would like. Uh, and <laughs> I think it's proving that the game is not as popular as it was at one time. Um uh, whether the, you know this uh, <laughs> this strikeout is just an out mentality just drives oh. me crazy because oh. it's not you put the ball in play anything can happen you know what I mean uh, yeah. uh, you know the shifts and uh, and uh, you know the way the starting pitching has been you know if you give me five terrific uh, or six boy that's great well you know uh, the bullpens the way you use them nowadays. Uh, and the and the, the so many delays in the games because you're bringing in so many relief pitchers and and don't even get me started about having a runner at second base in the in the tenth oh. inning. I mean, come on. I mean, I, you know, during the COVID year, fine, but it's time to get rid of that. And yeah, the, the game is not as, as as interesting, I don't think, or as good as it was just by having the DH around now. But in the Phillies' case, if they didn't have the DH this year, they wouldn't have Bryce Harper playing for them. So, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. But there are changes that could be made, and evidently they're working on them for next year. And you don't, uh, you, you know, the union and the and the and uh, the commissioner are together on a lot of them. So we'll see what they do. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give you one. Saramoro came in to pitch yesterday in the uh, Yankees Red Sox game. He's taking thirty-four to thirty-six seconds per pitch. Yep. Yep, he's got to go Ridiculous. through his routine. Get the ball and pitch it. <laughs> your routine was your your your, your, yeah. your routine wasn't working anyway. They're still hitting him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I've, evidently that will happen next year with the clock. What's it going to be like twenty seconds or something? Like yeah, that. and they've they've experimented enough with the America and the minor leagues now that they're sold on it. Now, of course, they need to get it into spring training right away and get some of these major league guys used to it and don't spring it on him when the season starts because then they'll be standing around arguing with the umpires and you'll have all the delays anyway and the game will still go three and a half hours because of that. But I really think that that's an important change. Um, and there's no reason why they can't get used to it and won't get used to it, and it will definitely help the game. Uh, I think they're going to give them a little more time if there's a man on base, but not much, maybe five more seconds or something like that. But with the way that they're giving signs now by, you know, giving it into the transmitter and the guy's hat and all those kind of things that they do in Spanish, and, you know, there's so much technology and stuff involved nowadays that they can do some things in baseball that the old purists like you and I will go, yeah, we need that stuff. We need to change. We need to do some things to make our game better because it's still a wonderful game. Uh, I always say it's still the game where you can't take a knee. Uh, you can't ice it, yep. and you can't dribble yep. it around. And the damnedest things happen with two outs and two strikes in a, in a, in a baseball game mm -hmm. that you either get it or it gets you, and it's still happening, and it's still one of the mm -hmm. great things about the game. So that part I still think is terrific. And, and Wheels, and people can't get confused here between the terms we're using. You and I and are you and I are talking about pace, not length of game. I don't mind. You can have great games that are three and a half, three forty-five. It's a great game, but you want to feel like it's been moving, and it's the pace we're talking about. Exactly, Steve. And it's also that enough not enough baseballs are not putting being put into play now, and right. that's where I'm getting back to the strikeouts. And a lot You're of it right. is be, well. There's two reasons. One, the pitchers are so good now, and so many of them throw so hard, and they only have to throw an inning or two so they can go out there and just, just air it out. And the other thing is these guys are swinging with this uppercut stuff to try and hit balls out of the ballpark all the time because it, you're supposed to hit home runs. Well, if they can somehow change the philosophy of hitting in the minor leagues to take it to the major leagues uh, and make the home run not so important – and also uh, to get the ball put into play more so that there's more action. Those are the two, two of the things that I look at and I would really like yeah. to see somehow uh, change. Something that's interesting, though, is that uh, the Red Sox have never stopped running. 
the Yankees are running more than ever this year. They already have 63, 64 stolen bases. It seems like a couple of the managers are, are like, while adhering to some of the analytics, are going off the reservation a bit because you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> right. You're never supposed to give up an out. Like, you don't, you don't, uh, well, you're not giving up an out when it's trying to run, but you have the potential to give it out. Like, you're not supposed to hit the, hit the ball the right side now with a man on second and nobody out. Oh, no, we don't ever want to do that anymore. That's giving up an out because of these analytics. We don't want to bun a guy over because that's giving up an out. Well, it's hard for me to argue with that stuff because I don't understand it anyway. And, you know, if that's what they want to play, they want to play. But, you know, Aaron Boone's a, Aaron Boone's a good friend. Uh, I knew him when he was born. Uh, so you know, yeah. so proud of him that, that, that he's. Yeah, we kid about that. I'll see him once in a while. I saw him in spring training this year. And I said, "You believe you're the manager of the Yankees?" He still looks up and he, we just laugh about it. Um, <laughs> but he he really, you know, we talked about running a little bit, and he said he thought they were going to run a little bit more this year, or, or try to run a little bit more this year. And there's nothing that puts pressure on a pitcher more than a guy that runs at first base because he gets fidgety. Uh, he, you know, he has a tendency that you want to throw more strikes. You're going to throw more fastballs to hitters. So I would love to see more of that come back in. And it shocks me that it's American League teams doing it more than National League teams. But yeah. now that we both have the DH, you know, there's not that much difference in the leagues. But running, hitting, running, putting balls into play, oh. those are the things that fans want to see. Because then you see the great defensive plays, too, or guys getting thrown out on the bases and that kind of stuff. All part of our sport that has kind of gone away that could come back very easily if you just make a few rule changes or changes in philosophy. It's called action. That's what it is. It's action. There's something <laughs> right. happening. It's fun. Right. All right. Okay, so, so now hey, we're going to do this. Favorite we... football, our favorite football team used to believe in just handing it to the running back. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, and I, Jack, and I, Jack and I kid all the time. Over, <laughs> with all due respect, because, I mean, we, you, know, I, you know Chuck Burkhart. You, you know Chuck Burkhart. Of course, Jack played with him. I've gotten to know Chuck over the years. He's an awesome guy. Never lost a game as a starter. But one right. year he had two tu- he had two touchdowns and nine interceptions. One year, <laughs> and they didn't lose a game. Don't get, don't get in the way. <laughs> have a great have a great offensive line and a fullback, and let the tailback run it. It worked pretty well, and have a great defense. But the, obviously, you know, football has changed in so many ways, and, it, and it's such a, a game. It's more like, in many ways, sometimes it's more like ba- watching a basketball game on grass. Yeah. Uh, not that yep. Penn State is that way, but uh, you know, have gotten have they've even gotten more that way. And the Big Ten obviously has gotten more that way when you watch Ohio State light it up with all those wide receivers. So baseball can change. It they definitely can change. Well, I gotta keep this fair. So now we got we gotta flip it around. So now it's your turn. Right? You get to ask <laughs> you get to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know I you know how I love to talk football with you, especially Penn yeah. State uh you know, as a fan, and all I do is read, uh, and, and, you know, because I don't get to talk to them inside, it seems like they're doing a really, really good re- job recruiting in the last, especially the last two or three seasons. So what do you think? What they've done is they, they've been able to, they're in the process of stacking two big-time classes back-to-back. That's really big for the foundation of the program. And the coaches have done a great job. James has done a great job. But I'll give you two guys that may be a little bit under the radar, Kenny Sanders and Alan Zemitis. Kenny <laughs> came back. You know Kenny. You sure. know Kenny. You, I, I do. And, and you know, and you know, you know the, his passion and enthusiasm. He had left and gone to Oregon. He came back. And then Zemitis. The biggest difference when you are uh, – entering a program and you haven't been to a place before is that when you go to recruit, you're selling, right? When you're somebody that's been a part of the program and it's a part of your fiber and background because you grew up in it, you end up sharing it. And Alan Zemitis' name keeps coming up all the time with people in the recruitment because he's out there not selling but sharing what a great experience it, it is here. And I think it's made a big difference. 
Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I do know Kenny really well. I, I got to know him uh, during the years when Josh was there, when Josh Gaddis was there. And, you know, yeah. he and I got to be pretty good friends where we'd, we would go out and, you know, talk inside football. And I love that because, you know, I was yeah. always used to it. I When I go out, everybody's got to pick my brain on everything. Well, man, I got to sit and listen to a guy like Josh Gaddis, who has obviously become – uh, done a great job and moving on and on to different jobs. And Kenny was with us a few times, uh, and I got to know Kenny. And he's a big Phillies fan. He's from you know from the area here down in here. And uh, I loved his enthusiasm, and I was really disappointed when he went to Oregon. So, yeah, that was great news when he came back, Steve. And I'm glad to hear that he's still doing the terrific things they did. So, Midas, I don't know other than he was a tough defensive football player, and you know you, he was never a spectacular guy, but uh, he was one of those guys that seemed to make plays when you needed them. And his his passion on the recruiting front. I mean, because I see this all the time. I mean, you know, it's, you know, they're bringing guys in all the time, and if they're on an official visit, I can talk and say hi to them. If they're not, then I got to, you know. So I've always got to figure <laughs> out who's an official and who's not, and I'm trying to play that game all the time. All right. Next question from Wheels. <laughs> I re- I remember th- I remember us. Uh, I remember oh, having God, to be yes. careful with the things you did <laughs> oh. that we did. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I've been lucky enough to stand on the sidelines <laughs> talking to the mothers of players. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah. Yes. My, all right. My next question is this licensing thing. Is Penn State at a disadvantage, or are they uh, are they able to get up to uh, to speed on this? And is it going to be okay? Started from behind. They've made great progress in a year. I think in another six to twelve months, they might be on par with other people. But they've been mm-hmm. able to close the gap on name, image, and likeness. Uh, which has been big. Dan Kabbalah, and you know Dan, has mm-hmm. been working very hard in that area with Andy Frank, and they've been able to really close the gap. And also the collective, and I've talked to the, one of the guys that runs the collective up here, good friend of mine, and he's been able to, he told me what their financial projections are. Financial projections are in 10 months uh, they think they can get the eight figures wow well that's big that's competing that's competing with the quote unquote big boys and that yeah. uh, you know like some of the southern schools or Ohio State or that sort of stuff so great that's great to hear my, alright my next one before I run out of time with you um, <laughs> the the, uh, the USC uh, UCLA the whole Pac-10 getting into the Big Ten. I know you always have opinions on things, and you know, I, obviously, I love the prestige of those two schools coming into our conference. But what do you think it does, good or bad? I think it's nothing but good. Uh, you know, I think they bring two big brands to the conference. Travel is not going to be quite the issue people think. Because I mean, Tara Vanderveer, the women's basketball coach at Stanford, said, "Oh, the travel for the other sports is going to be awfully tough and expensive." And she's coming at it from thirty-five million a year, which is what Stanford gets. Um, that I'm not going to throw in their thirty billion dollar endowment, but <laughs> but but they're, but they're thirty-five million dollars. I mean, the Big Ten might get, end up getting a hundred million per school. There's plenty of money to travel, and let's face yeah. it. Do you want to see Penn State play UCLA and USC? Yeah, you do, because for the fans, I think it's really fun. Now it's a question of how do you work out the scheduling, and I think it brings nothing but positives to the table. And I think Martin Jarmond, who's the athletic director at UCLA, now let's take it from their point of view, made a great point. This move means I can keep all 25 of my sports. And that means that means outside of football, basketball, that's 23 other sports that he has where you have athletes that won't be losing scholarships because they're, they're not going to drop programs. Well, that's good to hear that it, it encompasses that. And the other, the other thing i got to ask you before we go is, uh, you know, every year was the stuff with James that he was going to go here, he was going to do this, he was going to do that. 
signing that long-term deal, uh, and obviously you get out of it after a certain number of years, but how important was that with recruiting and stability and all that stuff? See, that's what this long that's what long-term deals mean, and you and I know that it's different between college and pro, all right? And in college, that's why you, you'll see he got a two-year extension through 27, or this guy got a three-year extension through whatever. You know, Joe would get extensions, you know, and he'd, he'd publicly <laughs> announce, I'm going to coach another four to five years. Well, why do you do that? You do that because you're telling the recruits, hey, look, I'm going to be here. Well, in 10 years, you sign a 10-year deal. Now, however long it goes, we'll see, but you sign a 10-year deal. Every single recruit they're recruiting right now feels really confident that that's going to be their coach, and I think it's made a difference in the in the in guys jumping on board and signing. Yeah, well, that's great to hear because you know you get tired of that every year. That the, because he is a guy that even though even though sometimes your own fans are never look, I've been around it for my whole life, and <laughs> you know you have a guy you know is the right manager on your ball yep. club, and the fans hate him. Yeah. Well, you know, know it's one of those things. So you're always going to have your people because you know we haven't beaten Ohio State enough and all that. Why do you want James Franklin around? He's not a winner and all that. Well, I've been lucky enough to be around him. You're around him a lot, and I've been lucky enough to be around him enough times. To, I told anybody that wanted to listen, I said, this guy is going to do some really good things up there, and he yeah. has, and he's going to continue to do it, in my opinion. So I'm glad to hear you say that because I thought it was great when he signed the long-term deal. Oh, so did I, because, again, you want stability. And I know we're going to get to the end here. But I always laugh about this at, at this this point. If a player transfers, oh, this loyal, oh, you know, oh, right. okay, right. then Clifford, I'm coming back for a sixth year. Oh, he's coming back for a sixth year. All right, same thing with the coach. Right? Oh, we had Joe all those years. We never had to worry. You know, this guy's a – he signs a 10-year deal. It's a 10-year deal. Make up your mind. <laughs> well, that's what being a fan is. Personally, I'm kind of happy to have Sean Clifford being there at Purdue this year and oh. not having one of those kids have to play right away. I can tell you in no uncertain terms, you are exactly right. <laughs> so, right? There, and you and I both and go know there are points. And they go to Auburn in two weeks after that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are points in time where you and I know from doing our jobs that when somebody's not quite ready, they're not quite ready, but then the light comes on you can see they're ready. Well, in the process of waiting for the light to come on, it's really great when you already know somebody is ready. Right. Just protect him and keep him on his feet, and everything will work out. You're the greatest. Take the world of Hey, you. I love, I love, this reminds me of one of our lunches. I love talking to you. We got to get together. Yes. <laughs> That's about what this was. One of our lunches. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Okay, Steve. Take care. Keep in touch.